The committee will come to order. Uh, the distinguished acting ranking member, Ms. Davis, is on her way, but uh, I understand it's, it's fine for us to go ahead. The House Armed Services Committee meets today to receive testimony from members of Congress on their national security priorities for the fiscal year 2016 National Defense Authorization Act. Just a quick note about format today. In consultation with the ranking member, we'll depart from our regular questioning process. Each witness will have four minutes to testify. Members of the committee who then want to ask clarifying questions will uh, raise their hand or make their interest known to the staff, and they will be yielded two minutes each for a maximum of four minutes for each witness. This will ensure that we can get through all of our witnesses today, and as this hearing is intended to be primarily a listening session, it is not my intent to engage in extended debate on various issues. Uh, we look forward to today's testimony and certainly thank our distinguished colleagues for their advocacy on behalf of our troops and our national security. First up today is the gentlelady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn, who's recognized for four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I want to thank all of you for allowing members of the House to come and testify on these issues of importance. As many of you know, I represent the 7th Congressional District of Tennessee, which is home to the brave men and women of Fort Campbell. Yes, and Ms. Wagner is going to cheer because her son is one of those brave men. Uh, Fort Campbell is home to the storied 101st Airborne, the 5th Division, and the Army's 160th Special Ops Aviation Regiment. Nearly 1,900 officers and 26,500 enlisted personnel call Fort Campbell home. Like many installations across the country, Fort Campbell is facing reductions that will have an impact on military readiness programs. I was pleased to work with this committee last year in support of the Army Flying Hours program. This vital program provides aviation training resources for individual crew members and units according to approved aviation training strategies. In addition, it also provides individual and collective proficiency in support of ongoing combat and non-combat air operations for aviation units like the 101st this training is not only vital to mission success, but it, to the safety of our personnel. Due to Army budget restraints, Army aviators will only be provided with 9.3 hours of training per crew per month. This is below the recommended increase to 11.3 <coughs> hours of training per crew per month. Currently, the active Army combat aviation brigades have a $55 million shortfall in meeting 100% of their critical re requirements. Without the necessary funding, home station training opportunities will not be available to achieve optimal combat readiness. I ask the members of this committee to once again pay close attention to restoring the Army Flying Hours program to its full capacity in fiscal year 16. I would also like to bring to this committee's attention the further reduction of our armed forces and how this will hamstring our ability to meet the challenges and the threats that we see in an increasingly destabilized world. As America withdraws from the international community, countries like Russia are becoming increasingly brazen. We see it in the annexation of Crimea by Russian-backed separatist civil war in Yemen and Syria and China's military buildup. As the discord continues to grow around the world, the U.S. must have the personnel and the capabilities to respond. If Fort Campbell is required to reduce its active duty personnel from 26,500 to 16,000, I worry about our ability to defend ourselves from threats and to project power internationally. Fort Campbell is already one of the most heavily deployed bases in the country. If it suffers a troop reduction, it is going to be felt and it will matter to our nation. When Ebola was spreading through West African countries, it was 700 soldiers from the 101st Airborne Division at Campbell that were deployed to build medical facilities and contain the outbreak. In the spring, 700 more soldiers from the 101st will be deployed to Afghanistan. 
Soldiers from Fort Campbell are always tasked with response to threats made against our security around the globe. Thank you for allowing me to testify this morning. I stand ready to work with this committee on strengthening programs and reviewing processes that are vital to our nation's defense. I yield back my time. Thank the gentlelady. Are there any questions of Ms. Blackburn? If not, thank you. Appreciate, uh, appreciate your comments and appreciate your input. Next, we'll have the gentlelady from Missouri, Ms. Wagner, to testify. Thank you for being with us this morning, and gentlelady's recognized for four minutes. Oh, thank you, proudly. Um, and I represent thousands of constituents that wear the uniform. I know firsthand the importance of this committee's work for our national security as you begin to debate our defense priorities for the coming fiscal year. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about a key defense priority for the United States Navy and our nation, the F.A. 18 Super Hornet. The past two years, I've become very familiar with the Navy's tactical aviation capabilities. Last year, this committee responded to the Navy's requirement for more electronic attack capabilities by providing five EA-18G growlers in the fiscal year 2015 National Defense Authorization Act. Congress then added 10 additional growlers on top of that during the appropriations process, and those aircraft will provide a warfighting capability that uh, no adversary can match. Growlers will keep our Navy equipped to overcome enemies today and in the future in all threat environments. For that, I'd like to say once again, thank you very much. Today I'm here to support adding F.A. 18 Super Hornet aircraft to the fiscal year 2016 NDAA. As you know, the Navy submitted uh, an unfunded requirement for 12 F.A. 18 F model aircraft. In testimony, the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Jonathan Greenert, stated that the Navy has a Super Hornet shortfall, in his words, uh, of at least two or three squadrons, the equivalent of some 24 to 36 aircraft. Uh, as you all are well aware, uh, an aging fleet of legacy aircraft, the delayed operational deployment of the F-35 program, and the higher than anticipated utilization of Super Hornets in combat are contributing to this shortfall. To this last point, the Super Hornet is truly the workhorse of naval combat operations against the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. My, by some estimates, the Super Hornets today are flying at four times the anticipated rate. It is, an abs it is absolutely critical, uh, critically in-demand weapon against our enemies. To exacerbate the shortfall challenge, the Navy has lost 15 Super Hornets and Hornets over the past five years to battle or training losses, aircraft that have not been replaced by the Navy or Congress. The, the strike fighter shortfall identified uh, in the unfunded requirement request is not uh, a new issue to the Navy. We all wish that the President's budget requested included, uh, or budget's request included additional F-A-18 Super Hornets, and we all expect the Navy to address the total extent of the shortfall in subsequent budgets. However, without aircraft in fiscal year 2016, the F-A-18 program faces a line closure decision. The F-A-18 manufacturing line is the only aircraft production with the ability to build operational strike fighters for the Navy today and AEA aircraft for the entire Department of Defense. Without it, the Navy couldn't address its shortfall, nor could it add growlers in the future. Recall that there is likely a larger joint uh, a requirement for more EA-18G growlers that is pending further analysis. I would not be in front of you today if funding additional af aircraft were not so vital to our warfighting capabilities. Uh, adding aircraft and keeping the F-A-18 line alive is the right thing to do to keep our military personnel safe 
and to keep our country and allies safe. I have provided a copy of the House letter signed by myself and my colleagues requesting additional aircraft. Th these are members who have stood by the committee to support defense authorization. I have also added a copy of the unfunded requirement highlighting the Navy's request for 12 aircraft, and I ask that both of these documents, Mr. Chairman, be submitted as part of my written testimony. In closing, I urge you to add 12 FA-18 aircraft to ensure the Navy can protect our nation now and in decades to come. I look forward to working with this committee and supporting the final NDAA legislation as it moves through the House of Representatives, and I stand at your service, and thank you so very much uh, for yours. Thank you. Chairman. Are there any questions, Ms. Wagner? I if not, thank you. Appreciate you being with us this morning. Next, we turn to the gentleman from Nevada, Mr. Hardy. Thank you for, for joining us, and you're recognized for four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, I'd like to thank the ranking member, Smith, and also the members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to testify before you uh, on the National Defense Authoriz Authorization Act for fiscal year 2016. There are 627 companies in the Nevada's 4th Congressional District registered to do business with the government. Uh, 459 of those are small businesses. Although they are, uh, received over $200 million in federal contracts last year, uh, and the options of the contract are in the billions, on behalf of those businesses, businesses and the businesses not yet pursuing federal work, I want to thank you for your work and on this uh, permanent reform or procurement reform. I especially want to thank the chairman and the ranking member for including uh, much needed reforms on the non-manufacturer rule, H.R. 1597, the Agile Acquisition, Acquisition Retra Retain Technology Edge Act of 2015. I also introduced uh, legislation on this issue because the issue could cripple the participation of small service contractors in the federal marketplace. As a former small business owner, I know the importance of clarification while trying to procure a contract by meeting the provisions required, which is why this legislation is very important to small contractors. Let me first explain what the non-manufacturer rule is, since it's perhaps the most, most poorly named rule there is out there. The NMR exists to prevent fraud for when the government is trying to buy manufactured goods like ball bearings or furniture. If a contract for office chairs is set aside so that only small businesses can compete, the last thing the government wants is a winning, winning small business buying chairs from a large business, marking them up and then delivering them. That's why the NMR says that in the case of contract for goods that is restricted to small businesses, the winning company must either make the goods itself or buy them from another uh, small manufacturer. While there are some expectations in the cases, there, is no, there are no small manufacturers. This is really, it is the truth in advertising, provisions that uh, works, that works pretty well. Unfortunately, the federal courts have st started applying the NMR to contracts for services so that, small builder, uh, that a small builder would now need to either manufacture all the building supplies or buy them from another small business. Likewise, a small company customizing software would now be required to manufacture the underlying software. This application makes no sense. We already have separate rules for service contractors that make sure that they aren't subcontracting all the work to large businesses. The government gets no benefit from putting additional supply chain burdens on small service contractors, but this restrict, restriction will limit the amount of competition for the $267 billion in services the government purchased last year. Therefore, the Small Business Administration agrees that we need to fix the statute to make it clear that the NMR only applies to contracts for goods. For these reasons, I strongly encourage the committee to include Section 504, H.R. 1597 in the fiscal year uh, 2016 National Defense Authorization. I would, all, would also like to lend my support to the testimony of Chairman Shabbat and encourage you to include the other small business contracting provisions in H.R. 1597 and H.R. 1481 
the Small Contractors Increase Competition Act of 2015. Thank you, and I stand ready for questions. Thank you. Are there any questions, Mr. Hardy? Great. Thank you. Appreciate you being with us and Thank appreciate you. your input. Next, Chairman Young. Thank you for being with us this morning. Gentlemen's recognized for four minutes. Traffic an hour and a half. Um, uh, I'm going to try to smile. I'll tell you that right now. But anyway, Mr. Chairman uh, and Ranking Member, I and my distinguished colleagues, uh, I'm here to talk about the state of Alaska and the mission. Um, According to Air Force Billy Mitchell, way back in many, many years ago, he said, he who holds Alaska holds the world. And I think Alaska is the most important strategic place in the world. It's true what General Mitchell said in 1933. That was the year I was born, by the way. Alaska offers an unparalleled training areas, including Joint Pacific Alaska Range Complex. While ranges in the lower 48 are parts of states, Jay Bear's training areas are the size of the states. Give you an idea, 65,000 square miles of encumbered airspace, that's the size of Florida. 2,490 square miles of land space, the size of Delaware. 42,000 square nautical miles of surface, subsurface, and overlaying airspace over the Gulf of Alaska, the size of Virginia. More than that, the support for our service members, their families, and veterans runs deep in Alaska. Alaskans actually duty military personnel combined with our Vietnam population our veteran population equate to more than 15% of the state's entire population. We as Alaskans pride ourselves in the strong, mutually beneficial relationship we have with our Alaskan-based military members. Many of those have been going overseas, actually deployed from Alaska. As you continue in the FY20,000 process, native process, I'd like to highlight several specific funding and language requests that are important to Alaska and the United States mission. First, I'd like to request the committee include a sense of Congress regarding the Air Force's F-35 basing in the Pacific. In August of 2014, the Ielson Air Force Base in Alaska was named as the preferred alternative for Pacific F-35 basing. Regardless, it's important to continue to highlight Congress's desire to see the Air Force consider Alaska's military value as part of its strategic basing process. Pacific F-35s would be based at a location that has the ability to host fighter-based bilateral and multilateral training opportunities, has significant airspace and ranges to meet its air training requirements, has existing facilities to support personnel operations and logistic needs, has limited encroachment from outside, and minimize the overall construction and operational costs. IELTSLIN offers the Air Force these capabilities. Second, I'd like to speak for a moment on the Alaskan Native Hawaiian Small Business Administration 8A program. Mr. Chairman, we've talked about this last year. This is a new section, Section 811, has a large negative effect on Native Americans Hawaiian community-based contracting organization presented in SBA 8A programs. And I will say, personally, I believe this program has worked well for the government, for the military, and the taxpayer. I also would support a no-cost land for this is a very small thing, Mr. Chairman, a no-cost land transfer from the Air Force to the city of Galena, Alaska. The western Alaska town of Galena was hit by a devastating flood in the spring of 2013. It was really a bad, bad flood. Federal and state disasters were declared and more than 75 million, 56 million federal and 19 million state has been spent to recover this city. While Galena has made great strides to recover from this terrible disaster, their residents are still vulnerable to their catastrophic floods due to the location of the Yukon River floodplain. To eliminate the flood threat, the city of Galena would like to move to higher ground. They have done surveys of the areas and found an optimal area above the floodplain in the former home of the Champion Air Force Radar Station. <clears throat> this area has been actually abandoned. It's still maintained by the Air Force, but very frankly, they don't have any objection if we could transfer to the city of Galena it costs nothing to the taxpayer. It will save the city <clears throat> and actually take land off the, the um, uh, out of the Air Force's hands. I also request funding authorizing $10 million for state-sponsored aerospace facilities, which have been funded before, a missile defense agency and ground-based missile defense and sensors. That's the PB-16. 
an F-35 procurement RDT&E, Alaska military construction, including projects at Fort Greeley and Isleson Air Force Base, the civil military, including the National Guard Youth Challenge and innovative readiness training programs, language for a report of efforts to reduce high energy costs of military installations, language to expand space available travel for gray area retirees. And remember, we have a lot of veterans and surviving spouses on airplanes that are available. Again, Mr. Chairman, I thank you and the ranking members and the members of the committee. I would like to suggest, Mr. Chairman, and I ask you this uh, personally to, and to the committee, come to Alaska. Uh, this is a fine military area. Has been, always has been, will continue to be. It is the key to our strategic mission as far as military goes. Many of the bases we have today in the lower 48 have really no, no uh, uh, contributing factor other than just being political. And I say this respectfully, if you want to solve a mission, you can get to anywhere in the world quicker from Alaska than any other base in the United States. Now, you might not say that about Guam or some Philippines, but it is an area. Mr. Chairman, with that, I thank you and answer any questions. Thank you. I know that there are a group of our members who are planning on going yes. to Alaska uh, before too long on, on one of their Pacific uh, trips. So any member have questions of Mr. Young? Great. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate you being here. <clears throat> On time, by the way. <laughs> Just don't hold this committee responsible for traffic, please. Right. <laughs> the committee is pleased to welcome the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Rothfuss, who's recognized for four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, members of the committee, for holding this hearing today and for receiving my testimony on the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2016. This morning, I'd like to focus my remarks on the Army's Aviation Restructuring Initiative. As you know, this policy will result in the transfer of the National Guard Apache helicopters to the active component. Army officials have stated that this restructuring is necessary to generate savings and make the remaining aviation fleet more affordable. I have long opposed this plan and for the second year in a row asked, Mr. Chairman, savings at what cost? Since September 11, 2001, the National Guard has repeatedly risen to the occasion. They have answered the call and fought bravely in Iraq and Afghanistan. At the height of these wars, nearly 50% of the Army's total force was a mix of reservists and members of the National Guard. The Pennsylvania National Guard alone contributed more than 42,000 individual deployments. They have fought side by side with the active component, all while continuing to achieve their important mission here at home. ARI will have devastating impacts on all that the National Guard has achieved. By stripping the National Guard of its Apache helicopters, the Army is ensuring that the National Guard will be less combat ready and less able to provide operational depth. It will also deprive our nation of an operational reserve for these aircraft, which is essential to the retention and management of talented air crews. This represents a fundamental shift in the nature and the role of the National Guard. It runs counter to the wisdom and preference of many members of Congress and their constituents. This issue is important in Pennsylvania and to the 1st 104th Attack Reconnaissance Battalion in Johnstown. These highly trained airmen and crew played an invaluable aerial support role in Afghanistan where they flew their Apache helicopters and fought alongside the active component. The Army now proposes to replace these Apaches with a smaller number of Black Hawks. This reduction will deprive the National Guard of both highly trained personnel and equipment. It will result in the National Guard being less effective, less combat capable, and less able to heed the call to defend this nation both at home and abroad. I offered similar criticism of ARI last year and joined my colleagues in urging this committee to create the National Commission on the Future of the Army. I also advocated that there should be no transfers or divestment of any Army aircraft, including Apaches, until after the Commission has had sufficient opportunity to, to examine ARI. I applauded the committee for including those important provisions in the FY15 NDAA, but I was disappointed to see that at the insistence of the Senate, the legislation also contained a glaring exception that allows the Army to transfer up to 48 Apaches prior to the Commission releasing its finding and recommendations. The Commission was established to offer a deliberate approach to addressing force structure issues like ARI. So how does it make any sense to permit the Army to transfer these Apaches before the Commission has done its work? The answer is simple. It doesn't. And we need to put a stop to this before it's too late. Even National Guard Bureau Chief General Frank Grass admits that once these transfers begin, it will be all but impossible to reverse them. 
For that reason, I respectfully request that the committee include a simple provision in this year's NDAA that prohibits the transfer of any Apaches until the end of fiscal year 2016. This will provide sufficient time for the Commission to release its report, for the Army and the National Guard to respond, and for the Congress to make a reasoned and well-informed decision. I recognize that this committee will be forced to make many difficult decisions over the next month, but this isn't one of them. Providing a temporary freeze on the transfer of Apaches just makes sense and will ensure that irreparable harm is not done to our National Guard without due deliberation. Thank you for the opportunity to address you this morning, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank the gentleman. Are there any questions? Great. Thank you. Appreciate, Thank you, appreciate you being here. Obviously, there are a number of members who have expressed interest in this, and we appreciate, uh, appreciate your input. Thank you. Next, we'll turn to Chairman of the Small Business Committee, Mr. Shabbat. Thanks for being here, Mr. Chairman, and you're recognized for four minutes. Uh, good morning, uh, Chairman Thornberry and the ranking member and other members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to testify uh, before you this morning on the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2016. Uh, let me begin by thanking the committee for its collaboration uh, with the Small Business Committee. Uh, in my 19 years on the subcommittee, or excuse me, on the Small Business uh, Committee, I've uh, seen the relationship between our two committees grow, and we certainly intend to uh, uh, continue uh, that, uh, that tradition. And so thank you for cooperation of all the members of this committee with the Small Business Committee. Um, I also want to compliment the chairman and ranking member on H.R. 1597, the Agile Acquisition to Retain Technological Edge Act. Uh, the bill has many provisions that will help small businesses uh, which I discuss in my written testimony, but I'll be brief in my oral testimony this morning, and I actually have a hearing in judiciary that I have to get back to on immigration, and we all know that that's a very important issue facing our nation uh, today. Uh, so, I, And I hope to see uh, uh, those provisions incorporated uh, in this year's NDAA. Uh, I'm here because I know there are several common sense reforms uh, that we can work together on uh, to see that small businesses can uh, compete fairly for federal contracts. Uh, the Small Business Committee has held three hearings on this subject over the past uh, few months, and I'd like to share with you some of the findings of those hearings. Um, first, the good news, uh, the government has met its goals regarding contract dollars uh, going to small businesses. Early indications are that we met the goal again uh, last year as well, so that's good news. The percentage of dollars awarded to small businesses is a good measure of success, but it's not the only measure. Uh, so here's the bad news. Within the last two years, we have lost over 25 percent of the small business firms registered to do business uh, with the federal government. Uh, within the Department of Defense, the number of small business contract actions fell by almost 70 percent, uh, but the size of the average individual small business contract increased by nearly 290 percent. Um, we have a declining small business participation rate, which could threaten uh, the core principle of competition, and as we all know, it's basic supply and demand. The more competition uh, you have, uh, the, 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 the better chance you have for restraining uh, prices uh, from going up. Uh, to address these problems, we've, uh, in the committee, introduced H.R. 1481, the Small Contractors Increased Competition Act. Uh, this bill would require that the Small Business Administration place a greater emphasis on small business subcontracting and participation rates. It would also make it easier for small businesses to joint venture and team up and crack down on several contracting abuses. Uh, it's a good first step uh, to helping our industrial base, and I've provided more detail in my written statement. Uh, I'd ask the committee to incorporate these provisions plus provisions in H.R. 838 and H.R. 1666 into this year's NDAA. Uh, again, the details of these provisions are in my written testimony, but I won't go into great detail at this time because I know the committee has time uh, restraints here. Our, our nation demands a vital small business industrial base. It is fundamental to the health of our nation as a whole. Uh, I look forward to working with this committee to ensure that small businesses continue to provide the Department of Defense and the federal government with innovative and competitive solutions to support uh, critical programs. And I want to, again, thank you uh, for uh, hearing our testimony this morning. Thank the gentleman. Without objection, a full written statement will be made part of the record. And, and let me just say, I too appreciate the strong collaborative relationship we have between our two committees on, on so many issues. Uh, Mr. Knight, recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'd like to uh, 
thank Chairman Shevitt for uh, his uh, testimony and add my support to, to his request that these provisions be included in this year's NDAA. Uh, H.R. 1481 includes language I introduced, H.R. 1390, the Small Business Joint Venturing Act of 2015, which he referred to. We all know how important competition is in the federal procurement system. Therefore, we should be encouraging qualified small business teams and joint venture to compete for federal contracts, not allowing agencies to put roadblocks in their way. I look forward to working with the, both committees to push this package of common sense reforms uh, as we move forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. And Mr. Chairman, if I, if I could just comment, uh, Mr. Knight, I know, has uh, been an extremely valuable member of the Small Business Committee already, and I know he's uh, done great things on this committee, and we are glad to see both committees having such a tremendous member. Appreciate that. Um, Mr. Ashford, did you want to be recognized? Sure, sure. Two minutes. I don't need two minutes, but I, I could you just, just for my edification, since I'm relatively new here, sure. getting, I think this is a, a super idea. Could you just go over those those two, what were the two bills now? And I could find them out myself. But. Yeah, well, br briefly what they deal with is, is for example, bundling. Uh, a lot of the contracts, which may at first appear to be, you know, small businesses involved or bundled, and they're actually a much larger company involved, or you have consolidation issues, um, and those are some of the some of the issues that we're facing, and these deal with the the, the detail is in all the the written testimony, which we right. I know because of the time constraints. Right, I don't, I don't need people. to go any further. I, I think this is exceptionally important, at least in our area of the country, where we have a large uh, military participation. So thank you very much. Uh, absolutely. And as, and as, uh, as we know, about 70 percent of the jobs nowadays created in the American economy are small businesses. And by definition, small businesses are companies generally under 500 employees, so they're not all that small sometimes. But uh, those are the jobs of the future. And I, I know we're, we're lacking in time, but it was interesting that I think a couple weeks ago in the New York Times had an article about how startups have decreased substantially since 2009 from the Prior to that, yeah. many of those startups are have tech, technological types of enterprises that could be candidates for this kind of work. So, and that's particularly disturbing. And that's one of the things that we had. I don't recall now if our committee resulted in the article or the article had something to do with our holding the hearing. But I know that right. that uh, that that is a fact, and and it's disturbing because it, it historically we've had more startups than businesses that right. died. And now that's reversed, and we have more businesses going out of business than businesses being created, and that's that's dangerous. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you again for being here. We'll thank let you, you get to your other hearing, uh, but we appreciate uh, appreciate your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Next, we have a gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Bost. Thank you for being here. Gentleman's recognized for four minutes. Thank you, Chairman Thornberry and Ranking Member. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to address the committee. First off, allow me to summarize uh, my written testimony, if I may, uh, for the need for additional FA-18 strike fighters. Mr. Chairman, the Navy is facing a critical shortage of the operational strike fighters. The FA-18 is the Navy's only operational strike aircraft the Super Hornet and its sister aircraft, the EA-18G Growler, provide critical strike and electronic warfare support in a mission against ISIS and terrorist organizations. Increased operational uh, tempos in the war on terror, combined with the Navy's other commitments to ensure safe and free navigation of the seas, is resulting in an aircraft utilization rate that is four times the expected rate of use. As a consequence, strike fighters are rapidly approaching the end of their active use. In recent testimony, uh, Chief of Naval Operations Admiral Greenert uh, stated that the Navy is experiencing a serious shortfall of between 24 to 36 Super Hornet aircrafts. The primary cause of these shortfalls are the above mentioned rate of utilization and issues with the speed of repairs to the legacy Hornets at the depots. The Navy inclusion of 12 FA-18 Super Hornet aircraft in their unfunded priority acknowledge, acknowledges that the sh these shortfalls. Unfortunately, the aircraft production line is at a critical juncture. Without congressional action, it may close. The inclusion of 12 additional strike fighters in the Defense Authorization Act will ensure that the Navy has the assets it needs to protect our nation. 
It will also protect the national security value provided by the St. Louis Area Defense Industry Base, the F-18 Super Hornet, and the EA-18G Growler program line represents more than 60,000 U.S. jobs with 800 supplier partners in 44 states. In closing, prudence requires we keep and maintain the F-18 Super Hornet and the EA-18 Growler production lines. I strongly urge the committee to authorize the Navy's request for an additional 12 FA-18 aircraft for the coming fiscal year. And once again, I thank the committee for the opportunity to address this matter. On a side note, as a U.S. Marine who was actually around when we first were testing the F-18, it kind of, uh, I look forward to working with any of you uh, to find out and make sure the importance of this and see, make sure we can put it in. Thank you. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Great. Thank you, sir. Are there any questions for the gentleman from Illinois? Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate, appreciate your time this morning. Appreciate your input. Next gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Fitzpatrick. Thanks for being with us. Gentleman's recognized for four minutes. I thank the chairman and the uh, ranking member for this opportunity. With the continued threat of terrorism to the homeland, each of us only has to remember back to the attacks of September 11 to comprehend the devastation caused when our nation's airliners were turned into weapons. That is why I'm asking for the committee's help in protecting our skies from terror hijackings by requiring any aircraft that participate in the Department of Defense Civil Reserve Air Fleet Program to secure their cockpits by installing secondary barrier doors. These secondary barriers are light, inexpensive wire gates that protect the flight deck while the cockpit door is open. While it is true the cockpit doors have been strengthened in light of the terrorist attacks, the preventative measure only works when it is closed. What happens when a pilot needs to open the door for any reason during the course of the flight? This lapse in security can provide an attacker just enough time to strike and to take control of the plane. In fact, a video has surfaced online that shows it takes only two seconds for a terrorist to breach the cockpit once the door is open under current protocol. The recent German Wings tragedy shows us the danger when someone with bad intentions is able to lock themselves behind the reinforced door. Unlike the heroic efforts of the passengers of United Flight 93 that crashed in my home state of Pennsylvania, there is almost nothing the passengers can do to retake the aircraft in this very real scenario. As a Congress, we are tasked with many responsibilities, chief among them the protection of our constituents and our country. We can no longer ignore this obvious hole in our anti-terror measures. This Congress must act now to address this shortcoming. If there's one thing al-Qaeda and ISIS seeks, it is a high-profile attack that is cheap for them to execute. And right now, for the cost of one trained extremist and a first-class ticket, al-Qaeda or ISIS can turn our aircraft into a weapon once again. This is our reality. Earlier this year, ISIS sympathizers were arrested by law enforcement in New York City and found to have had plans to hijack an aircraft. Last month, a passenger on a United Airlines flight rushed the cockpit. Three weeks ago, the whole world was tragically shown the heart-wrenching consequences of this danger when someone locked the pilot out of the cockpit and deliberately crashed German Air Wings Flight 9525. As pilots will tell you, this is not hard to fix. A 2013 study found that secondary barriers are very cost-effective, require little maintenance, and reduce risk at a modest cost. Pilots, flight attendants, and federal law enforcement have been making the case to have these doors on every aircraft. Last Congress, 60 members of the House and 10 senators joined our effort, understanding that the mandate of the 9-11 Commission to protect the cockpit will only be realized when every passenger aircraft in the country is secured with these cost-effective barriers. Nearly one-third of the 38 co-sponsors of my bill, H.R. 911, that adds secondary barriers to every single aircraft in the country are members of the Armed Services Committee. My ask today, Mr. Chairman, is much more tailored. The NDAA is one way Congress can work to at least eliminate the glaring vulnerability that is putting our troops at risk. We must guarantee that any aircraft that transports our brave men and women in uniform is never turned into a weapon and our troops into helpless victims. So here's how we can fix this. As you know, the Department of Defense, in partnership with the U.S. airline industry, operates the Civil Reserve Air Fleet. 
In exchange for the air carriers committing a limited number of aircraft to this program, the airlines received the opportunity to do business with the Department of Defense. In fact, the GAO study shows that the airline industry has received over $30 billion in business since 2001 through that program. Only about 350 aircraft would be affected by this requirement, but those are the 350 aircraft that transport some of our most precious cargo, our troops. I appreciate the opportunity to address the committee. I would like to recognize that my constituent, Ellen Saracini, who's the widow of United Airlines Flight 175 pilot Victor Saracini, uh, is here today. Uh, Victor's flight was hijacked by al-Qaeda terrorists on September 11 and flown into the World Trade Center just after 9 o'clock in the morning. Victor was a naval aviator, a veteran of the United States Navy. So with Victor in mind, the 3,000 victims of 9-11 and our troops today, I offer these remarks. Be happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you, sir, and I, I appreciate you bringing this issue to my attention at least, because the secondary barriers is not something that I really had thought about or been aware of before. Um, any other questions for the gentleman? Thank you. Appreciate, appreciate you being with us and appreciate you uh, raising them. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> Next, we'll invite the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Corbello, to, uh, t to uh, provide testimony. The uh, gentleman is recognized for four minutes. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, good morning to all the members, especially uh, a uh, special greeting from my distinguished colleague from Florida, uh, Mr. Nugent. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to testify before you on the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2016. Like my colleagues, I'd like to thank the chairman and the ranking member for their leadership on procurement reform and suggest an additional area that requires the committee's attention, in my opinion. Within Florida's 26th congressional district, that's the southernmost district in the country, there are 649 companies registered as federal contractors, including 448 small businesses. Those small businesses won over $61 million in federal prime contracts last year out of the $440 billion spent on federal contracts. That is why I believe that those 448 companies and the 289,000 small contractors nationwide could be doing more if we only took subcontracting more seriously. Subcontracting is incredibly important for small businesses. Any large business receiving a contract for more than $650,000 must tell the federal government how it will use small businesses as subcontractors. This ensures that we have a healthy industrial base at all levels. Additionally, since about 80% of federal contracts are awarded to large businesses, this is where the money is. In fiscal year 2013, small businesses received $86.7 billion in subcontracts, which is just about $5 billion less than they received in prime contracts. As part of the fiscal year 13 NDA, this committee enacted legislation to hold agency officials accountable for small business utilization. Specifically, when agencies were considering whether senior agency executives deserved bonuses, it required that the agencies consider whether the contracting goals were being met and the role of said executives in meeting those goals. Even though the importance of sub subcontracting was again acknowledged by this committee as part of the FY14 NDA when it included language drafted by Congressman Graves to count lower tier subcontractors towards subcontracting goals, agencies are disregarding congressional intent. When agencies implemented the FY13 language on goaling, they took the term goals to mean prime contract goals, ignoring the role of subcontracting. As a consequence, prime contracting dollars have increased, but the percentage of some subcontract dollars awarded to small businesses has been falling and is down 2.5 percent since 2010. Likewise, agencies have not even started implementing the FY14 language. This means fewer small suppliers, manufacturers, and innovators. Subcontracting is an important entry point for new federal contractors. So if we have fewer subcontractors today, we will have fewer prime contractors tomorrow. For these reasons, I introduced H.R. 1386, the Small Entrepreneur Subcontracting Opportunities Act of 2015, or the CESO Act, 
with Mr. Shabbat, Mr. Gibson, and Mr. Bost. CESO requires that agencies look at subcontracting accomplishments as well as prime contracting accomplishments when evaluating performance of senior executives. CESO was included in H.R. 1481, the Small Contractors Improve Competition Act of 2015, and passed the committee on March 25th with bipartisan support. In Spanish, the word CESO means brains, and I hope you will agree with me that including the CESO Act and other provisions in H.R. 1481 in the FY16 NDAA is the smart thing to do. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any member of the committee have questions? Great. Thank you, Thank you. For, for being here and for bringing it to our attention. Next, gentlelady from Michigan, Ms. Lawrence. Thanks for being with us this morning. Thank you. Ladies, recognize for four minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for having me here this morning. I would like to thank all the members of the committee for allowing me this opportunity to speak on this important manner. Mr. Chairman, warfare is changing. We are in a time of fighting on multiple forms, fronts, using weapons we could not have even imagined during the Vietnam era. Most of these weapons require knowledge of cyber warfare, the ability to use missiles and drones to fight from a distance. The fast-paced advance of technology is producing changes in the threats we face. How can we keep up? The answer is to be just as innovative with our human resources strategy as we are with our weapons and tactics. The Department of Defense has adopted new and powerful technologies that make the military more effective and efficient. Despite the power and speed of these technologies, we still have some major cyber vulnerabilities. Whether through internet-based attacks or malicious cyber hardware, we are the primary target of cyber attacks, jeopardizing or seriously impairing our military operations. We must do more to, to prevent enemies from using our cyber vulnerabilities against us. I believe we have to provide for a private development of cybersecurity supply chain ratings and accred accreditation. While the Department of, of Defense is the most reliable government protector of the cyber supply chain, more work requires, is required to be done. Our business community is ready to accept this challenge. In Michigan, we are ready to meet the challenge. We have supply chains that feed such large defense contracts. Our connection to the defense industry is a long and well-established one. Each part of the military has a need for defensive cyber capabilities and many also have the need for offensive capabilities. U.S. Cyber Command is, a crit is critical for ensuring leadership and a centralized command for cyber operations. While Cyber Command set a goal of 133 operational cyber teams by the end of 2016, as of February 2014, only 17 were fully operational. We need to properly support the development, training, and deployment of these teams. Implementing these policies together with expanding existing policies such as cyber information sharing between the public and private sectors will better prepare the Department of Defense to face serious cybersecurity challenges. Finally, as you address cyber operation squadrons for air National Guard. I would like to express my strong support for the 110th attack wing of the Michigan Air National Guard in Battle Creek, Michigan to host a cyber squadron. Battle Creek Air National Guard base existing cyber missions mean that much of the infrastructure required for this new mission is already in place. Projections show that a cyber operations squadron at Battle Creek, Michigan, will save 2.2 million 
compared to a location without such capabilities. Michigan current workforce and universities provide a strong foundation for current and future recruiting efforts. Michigan has a network of highly skilled IT professionals and qualified defense personnel. Michigan has 22 colleges and universities that offer degrees in cybersecurity, including five colleges that have earned the NSA Center of Excellent Des um, Destination. Distinction, I'm sorry. Cybersecurity is also a gender neutral occupation, allowing both men and women to serve our country and protect our nation as equals. I hope that we will continue to see this growing area of concern addressed through effective human resources and adequate funding for advanced technology. I am aware of how difficult the job is in these tough, complex times. You serve to address the needs of our military service members, their families, and their civilian counterparts at a time when we are facing security issues on multiple fronts. This is an awesome power, and as such, it comes with a high responsibility. As you consider national security provisions that focus on cyber warfare, I respectfully ask that you consider the great state of Michigan and its ability to support our national cyber missions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I will take any questions. I think the gentlelady, certainly cyber is one of the most important and most challenging issues we face in, in anywhere in national security. And so I appreciate very much the gentlelady's comments. Are there any questions? Thank you. Thank appreciate you. you being with us today. Next, uh, we'll go to the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Ross. Uh, Thanks for joining us. Gentlemen's recognized for four minutes. Thank you, Chairman Thornberry, members of the committee. It is a pleasure to be here today to speak uh, regarding the fiscal year 2016 National Defense Authorization Act. This year, I introduced House Resolution 1337, legislation to waive the time limits for the award of the Distinguished Service Cross to Edward Grady Holcomb for acts of extraordinary heroism during the Korean War. I want to offer my thanks to my good friend, uh, Representative Nugent, and to the rest of the members of the committee for including this legislation in the FY 2016 NDAA. This Distinguished Service Cross is the second highest military decoration that can be awarded to a member of the United States Army, and for years my staff has worked with longtime Mulberry, Florida resident Grady Holcomb, who proudly served during the Korean War to be awarded a Distinguished Service Cross. Recently, I received confirmation from the Secretary of the Army, John McHugh, who personally affirmed that Grady Holcomb should be awarded with the Distinguished Service Cross for his valor in the service. However, there is a time limitation in the U.S. Code currently preventing this award from being presented to Mr. Holcomb. To address this, I introduced legislation to ensure this American hero will receive the award he earned in service to his country and his efforts to save the lives of fellow service members so many years ago. On July 27, 1950, Private Holcomb fought in the Battle of Anhui as a member of Company B, 1st Battalion, 29th Infantry Regiment. This battle resulted in the worst single unit American fatality rate of the Korean War. With only 24 of 235, which is 10.2 percent of the soldiers surviving, enemy forces captured Private Holcomb after he was wounded and most of his unit was killed. Now, Mr. Holcomb is a very humble and private man. In his time as a POW, was rather enduring. And what I want to just relate to you now is just some of what he experienced, but it's greater than what we say here. After capture, Grady Holcomb endured a 150-mile march from Anue to Seoul with little food or water. In the Seoul prison, Private Holcomb assumed by his competence and inexplicable stamina the role of chief medic. At age 19, Grady Holcomb supervised nine other med medics and cared for up to 376 American prisoners. At great personal risk, Grady Holcomb exposed himself daily to disease and infections while depleting his own strength by virtually never leaving his patient's side for over a two-month period in garrison or on the 120-mile death march from Seoul to Pyongyang. Although aware that six soldiers were being routinely murdered by North Koreans, Grady Holcomb volunteered to remain in Seoul with the sick and wounded who were separated from the main prisoner column marching to Pyongyang after the Inchon landing. 
When forced to leave Seoul to begin the death march, he rallied the feeble soldiers and escorted them until they caught up with the main POW column. Lastly, Private Holcomb then successfully helped plan and execute a daring escape with four other prisoners in Pyongyang despite the presence of overwhelming enemy forces. Awarding the Distinguished Service Cross to Edward Grading Holcomb is a long overdue honor for a man who risked his own health and safety as a POW during his times in Seoul on the death march and at the death camp in Pyongyang to care for and defend his fellow prisoners. I want to thank Secretary McHugh and his staff at the Pentagon and all of you here on the Armed Services Committee for working with my staff to include this important and needed provision in this year's NDAA. I thank you and I yield back. Any questions? Mr. Nugent? Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, I just want to thank uh, Mr. Ross for bringing this forward. Uh, you know, uh, these guys serve and they don't ask for much. It's amazing. Uh, it, it really is. And uh, for you to bring this forward, and I appreciate the chairman for allowing it to be in the chairman's mark, uh, it, it is the right thing to do. I agree, and thank and, you. And just for a time lapse, um, you know, some things take a while to, to work out. And so I just really want to appreciate what you did for Mr. Holcomb, and I'm sure he and his family would appreciate it too. Thank He's you so very much. Definitely fun. earned it. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Further questions? Definitely a remarkable story. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ross. Thank you. Next, gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer. Appreciate you being with us this morning. Gentleman's recognized for four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the courtesy of the committee uh, being able to share two points with you. One, uh, I want to thank the committee for your tireless efforts on behalf of the foreign nationals who worked with us in the theater of Iraq and Afghanistan. And it's been an honor working with um, your colleague, Ms. Gilbert, uh, uh, to, um, be, Gabbard, to be able to move this forward. It's been kind of uh, a hairspring uh, effort, walking up to the cliff, but thanks to your leadership and others coming together in a bipartisan fashion, we've been able to increase the necessary number of visas. We've been able to accelerate the processing. Uh, but we're, uh, in fact, we're being penalized a little bit because of our success. We're running out of visas. And we're, uh, uh, we may have only 1,600 left. It's going to be uh, soon exhausted. Uh, we need, desperately need provisions in your underlying bill to help us continue this progress. Um, it's the, the least we can do for people who put their lives on the line for Americans and are now at risk because there are people with long memories who are setting scuttling scores. These are people who are shot, kidnapped, their families are at risk, uh, and we need to keep the supply of uh, visas available to them. And I have more detail in my written testimony, but. Part of it's to thank you. Second is to keep this alive uh, through your legislation, which will make it much, much easier to navigate the difficult legislative shoals that you've seen in the past. The other point I wanted to make dealt with investments in uh, uh, dealing our, with our nuclear arsenal. Uh, we are on a path to invest far more than is needed and, frankly, what the country can afford. A recent report from the nonpartisan CBO estimates that the nuclear weapons planning currently in the pipeline calls for spending more than $350 billion over the next decade. And there are estimates that suggest that it will far exceed a trillion dollars over the next 30 years to build a force that will be more than the, than the administration and security experts have said is needed to effectively deter our nuclear threat. Former military officials have acknowledged that the plan is unaffordable. Former Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General James Cartwright, said the United, Nation, the United States nuclear weapons modernization plans, the challenge here is we have to recapitalize all three legs of the nuclear triad. We don't have the money to do it. A recent defense panel report called these plans unaffordable and a threat to needed improvements in conventional forces, and I have more detail in my written testimony. Uh, but not only are they unaffordable, the scope is unnecessary. The Pentagon's 2013 report 
declared that we can ensure the security of the united states and our allies and partners and maintain a strong and credible strategic deterrent while safely pursuing up to a one third reduction in deployed nuclear weapons from the level established in the new start treaties other experts including a commission chaired by former uh, general cartwright said the america america could go even lower without jeopardizing security our nuclear weapons are not helping us with isis uh, with other challenges that we face. We have far more than we need to destroy any country on the planet. And the point is that it's eating into your ability to be able to deal with the myriad of other challenges that we face uh, for our conventional forces that we do need. Um, I've introduced legislation. We call it the Smarter Approach to Nuclear Expenditures, the SANE Act a bill that would save the United States approximately $100 billion over the next 10 years by reducing or eliminating unnecessary nuclear weapons programs. As you consider the 2016 defense authorization, I hope there will be a hard look at what we really need and what we really can afford and the impact it's going to have on the other important things that you're challenged with balancing. I appreciate your courtesy in permitting me to speak today. I don't envy you your hard work, and I hope you will consider these two suggestions. Well, we definitely appreciate the input. Are there any questions? Great. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate, appreciate you being here. Next, we'll turn to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gomert. Thank you for being with us and sharing your testimony. Gentlemen, recognized for four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much for being willing to hear testimony from others uh, and appreciate the other members of the committee, the work you do. Um, after the attack on our military at Fort Hood, November of 2009, we suffered another shooting here at a military installation at the Naval Yard, followed by the Obama administration appearing to do nothing effective to prevent future of such attacks. Our military members uh, are normally authorized to carry automatic weapons, fire RPGs, drop bombs, shoot tanks and missiles that can kill dozens, thousands even of people. Yet, the question remains, why shouldn't they be able to carry a weapon on military installations here in the United States? Some commanders, I understand, I've talked to them, have an issue uh, with some carrying weapons on military installations here in the U.S. Uh, some have a problem with open carry on a military installation here in the U.S. Some have a problem with concealed carry, but would be okay with open carry. Others I've talked to, including a uh, retired top general, said uh, maybe the best way would be to have uh, people on duty as duty officers or enlisted members who were carrying while they were on duty. Um, some have said, look, even overseas, we have some that uh, we don't allow to carry weapons overseas. Fine, check them out. But it seems like there ought to be a process put in place, just like some states like Texas has, where you could apply for a carry permit, make it open. Uh, make it concealed, depending on what uh, the Army felt was the best needs uh, at that installation. But at a minimum, we should at least have military members, in addition to MPs, who are authorized to carry weapons. Um, and, and perhaps you could designate, like we do in most states, uh, if you're off-duty or on-duty, law officer, MP, CID, or even intelligence, or maybe your field grade or above, or E8 or above, whatever the military felt was appropriate, but allow some people around a military installation to carry a weapon on or off-duty. There was an article by Arthur Byrd in the Wall Street Journal sometime back that said, the people that instigate these events by firing and killing people want to conclude their, their attack themselves. So if they're afraid someone is going to shoot them and stop them, they won't instigate the attack. And the best thing, the, the best news we could ever get is that because something you put in the NDAA uh, was there 
we never had another shooting. There was nothing else to report. So I would ask that the committee please consider this issue in the NDAA. I just know we've got military members killed twice, and to prevent our military members trained with weapons from defending themselves on their own military installation really should be unconscionable. On another note, very quickly, I visit with so many friends in different services of the military, including visiting with some in the past two weeks, including visiting with some at Fort Hood last Friday during the Purple Heart presentation, who question how unfair it is for Christians to be told, and Christian chaplains who've been, who have said they've been told you cannot pray in Jesus' name. Jesus said, if you ask for it in my name, then it'll be given. So it is a, a prohibited act to prohibit somebody from practicing their religion. And I know we give up uh, uh, many of our rights when we go into the military. I didn't have freedom of assembly or freedom of speech at Fort Benning. One other matter, at Fort Hood, I know that this committee will, is concerned about it. Secretary McHugh says he's working on it. But to see these members that got the Purple Heart and know, as one said, it's like a slap. Here's the medal, but you really don't deserve it, so you're not getting benefits. I hope the committee will address that. Be glad to answer any questions. Thank the gentleman for raising three important issues. Are there any questions? Thank you. Appreciate appreciate Mr. You being Chairman. Here. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you, sir. The committee. A gentle lady from North Carolina, Ms. Elmers, uh, thank you for being with us this morning. Gentle lady is recognized for four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the ability to come and testif testify before you um, in the House Armed Services Committee. Mr. Chairman, I am the proud representative of the Second District of North Carolina, which is ho home to Fort Bragg. I would like to draw attention to an incredibly short-sighted decision the United States Air Force has made, which, in, which is deactivation of the 440th Airlift Wing, located at Par Pope Army Airfield at, at Fort Bragg. The 440th Airlift Wing is the only C-130 H model wing in the country that the Air Force is choosing to close completely. And this is occurring at the behest of the, of the busiest airfield in the world for training requiring tactical airlift. The Air Force wishes to remove all organic airlift from Pope Army Airfield and away from the 18th Airborne Corps and the 82nd Airborne Division Global Response Force, as well as Army Special Forces groups. This is a decision that essentially takes the air out of airborne, as planes have been located at Pope since 1954. The removal of the 440th Airlift Wing at Pope Army Airfield not only lacks strategic merit, but is it, it injects avoidable and unreasonable risks into the readiness of some of the most unique and rapid deployment forces our nation's military has to offer. To say that this has been an oversight and is occurring, um, and in regard to this decision, a severe understatement. This ill-conceived proposal comes at a time when our nation is facing growing uncertainty abroad and could require a military response that only forces at Fort Bragg can provide. This joint mission was formed over the last eight years to provide the Airborne and the Special Forces with easily accessible and high-quality training so that they can carry out any mission they are asked without the risks of distance that is often created by bureaucratic, logistical, and operational delays. Eliminating the ability to rapidly mobilize, train, and deploy the local commanders, air crew, and aircraft that has established relationships with our most in-demand forces increases risk at an unacceptable rate. Now, the Air Force has repeatedly assured me that this will not impact military readiness, but the very client that the Air Force serves the 18th Airborne Corps disagrees. I have spoken with Lieutenant General Anderson, the commanding general at Fort Bragg, and there is a true feeling that this decision will impact his training abilities. I am pleased to say that my North Carolina colleagues have rallied around me in both the House and the Senate in a bipartisan manner in order to prevent the Air Force from making this poor decision. I brought this fight to the attention of former Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel and currently Secretary Ash Carter. 
Just within the last month, I've sat down with both North Carolina Senators and we met with Secretary of the Air Force Deborah James and Chief of Staff of the Air Force General Welsh. It is my hope this committee sees the vital role that the 440th provides in maintaining the readiness and operational standards of the paratroopers and special forces stationed at Fort Bragg. Mr. Chairman, I, res I respectfully request that you maintain the mission of the 440th Airlift Wing and its C-130s. In conclusion, I believe it is more important that, than ever that the United States maintain the military superiority and continue to be the dominant force in the freedom for, in the world. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I look forward to working with the committee on any of the challenges facing our military, and I welcome any questions, and my staff and I are ready at any time to provide additional information, and any questions that you might have, I'm happy to answer. Great. Thank you. Well, I know we have uh, worked with you and your office on this issue in the past, and we will certainly continue to do so. Are there any questions? Uh, Mr. Chairman, just a, a comment Agent. from a father of a couple of guys, or one, that uh, was stationed at Fort Bragg yeah. for six years. I will just tell you that military airlift capacity is huge, but the training capacity, exactly. you know, down at the green ramp where the soldiers go down to get requalified or to do more jumps to stay qualified, is so important. What was the Air Force's? So how are they going to how are they going to make up that lost capacity for the 82nd? Well, the the Air Force maintains that the the military readiness will continue to be there, and that the training will not be affected because they will be able to bring in C-130s from other, um, you know, deployment other areas. But at the same time, we all understand that a schedule and weather and all these different things that can happen can interfere with that. So that provides the problem for our paratroopers and their training and their avail availability, their ability to be ready, their availability to to complete the mission. You know, I, I was there at Pope um, Airfield and, you know, um, monitoring and watching some of their training missions. And that particular day, one of the paratroopers actually died in the training um, exercise. So, and I understand, the Air Force understands that this is very important as well. But at the same time, I just believe that this operation itself is so crucial and it is so unique that it, it is hard for me to justify and see the need for them to dismantle it. Well, I just worry that, you know, we've had issues in regards to getting troops to Haiti when there was an earthquake down there. We had paratroopers sitting on the tarmac at 17 hour mark and had to wait two days to catch a lift. Mm -hmm. And so I worry that when you start degrading our capacity at, at that air base to provide that lift, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to worsen not just two days, it's going to be a week before we get that capacity. Mm -hmm. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I, I thank you for the additional time. Go back. Thank the gentleman. I appreciate the gentlelady being with us uh, and, and bringing, continuing to bring this issue to our attention. Thank you, thank sir, you. and thank you. Thank you. Next, we have the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Hurd. Thank you for, for being here this morning. The gentleman's recognized for four minutes. Here today and for having this opportunity. Um, I had just spent, uh, I was at Fort Bliss in El Paso, Texas twice over the last two weeks. I got, I'm proud to, to report that morale is high. Um, they're excited to continue doing their mission and they appreciate the support that this committee um, has given to them over the years, the largest facility in DOD's um, arsenal. And they're even more excited about the, the hopefully the opportunity uh, for the funding levels to be where they should be. And, and they're appreciative of the work that you and, and this committee ha have done. What I want to do today is, is talk about three, three quick points. Um, one is Laughlin Air Force Base in Del Rio, Texas. Laughlin produces more pilots than any other facility um, in the Air Force's arsenal. And if it rains more than an inch, the, the entire flight deck is flooded and they have to stop operations. And they have proposals in place um, in order to fix this, correct this, this problem in, in stages. And I hope that this committee and the, and the authorization process uh, funds that to make sure that we're training as many pilots as, as we possibly can. And the other thing I want to talk about is Joint Base San Antonio and the number of bases in San Antonio. San Antonio is becoming Cyber City uh, USA. We have the 24th Air Force, the 25th Air Force. We have NSA Texas as well. And the, 
and, and not being part of the national uh, capital region, you know, there's resources in San Antonio and the continued support of the cyber operations in San Antonio is something that we're looking forward um, from this committee. And the last point is something I'm hoping to work with this committee on is as my role as the chairman of the Information Technology Subcommittee on Oversight and Government Reform. When a soldier, airman, a Marine uh, leaves DOD or they're medically discharged, they have to physically carry their records over to the VA or to Social Security. It's 2015. Um, that shouldn't happen. And it creates gaps in, in coverage um, oftentimes. And having 1.5 million veterans um, in my district, this is something that I think we can solve. And the technical solutions um, are the easy part. I think we need the political will uh, to solve this, not only for the folks currently um, serving this mission, but those who have left. So with that, I want to thank you again uh, for your support and um, pending any questions. I thank the gentleman for raising all of those issues. It has been enormous frustration for this committee. The, the transition issues out of the military to the VA or to the other things and the, techno and the technology uh, delays that, uh, that the organizations are having, and, uh, and we will definitely stay on top of that. Um, are there questions for Mr. Hurd? Thank you. Appreciate you raising these important issues. Um, and I believe that's uh, all of our witnesses today. So with that, this hearing stands adjourned.